Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our podcast. Today, we have the amazing Erica Rankin. Initially got connected, I think, on LinkedIn. I believe we have a combined almost 100,000 followers. You're really carrying the weight there, so thank you for that. But we are super excited to have another female founder on, hear about your background, your story. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, we'd love to get started. Sure. Yeah. So thanks for having me on, Destiny. I'm super excited for this conversation. Um, So I am Erica, the founder and chief everything officer of Brodo. It is basically a better for you snack company. We have an edible protein cookie dough that is plant-based, lower in sugar, added protein. um, And we're launching a new product into the US market very soon. So we're no longer just a cookie dough company. We sell direct to consumer and we're available in retail stores in Canada. And then I also have Grow with Erica where I help companies and individuals like yourself grow on platforms like LinkedIn, TikTok, and Instagram. That is amazing. So there's around 3,000 things I want to ask you. But I think first and foremost, it's easy to have an idea. I mean, I think we see all the time friends, family throwing around, this should be done. We should do this. And you kind of carved a unique niche. But not only did you have an idea, you activated on that. And I think that's absolutely amazing. But what was the spark that made you be like, I'm going to do this and this is how I'm going to do it? I have like a really weird story. So I initially wanted to be a psychiatrist. So I studied psychology, got my degree, started working in my field um, and decided to take like a gap year between pursuing my master's and graduating. And I started working a job that I thought I really would love. And I hated it. I was miserable. I was making minimum wage. And I started listening to podcasts at my desk. So I would go into work every day, kind of block out you know, the world and do my data entry, scan documents, answer the phone, and then listen to this entrepreneurship podcast. Um, and I had never been exposed to that sort of lifestyle. Like I grew up and you know, like my parents worked nine to five jobs, my friends worked nine to five jobs, grew up in a really small town, um, never knew that that was a viable path that I could take. So it kind of opened my eyes to other opportunities and other paths that I could take. Um, and about a year into working my job, like I was also working as a personal trainer and at a bakery and putting in six hour weeks, but was super unfulfilled. And it got to a point where my contract was going to renew at my full time job and I decided to just quit. Um, and I booked a one way ticket to Thailand and I went backpacking for three months across Southeast Asia. And on that trip, I met entrepreneurs, um, that were doing all different types of businesses. And, um, a lot of them didn't really even have business experience. Some of them were dropouts. Um, some of them were pursuing different things and then decided to switch and try something completely new with no experience. So that kind of planted the seed in my head. And then when I got home, I decided to sit down, brainstorm, and then put together a business plan. So that's how it all came about. That is amazing. Just jump. Like, I think that's the best piece of advice you just gave is just figure it out, backs against the wall, make it happen. Yeah, I think like I knew what I didn't want to do. And I knew that like I wasn't able to like work for someone. That's just not me. It's not in my DNA. And I tend to be very, um, I don't know, impulsive, I guess you could say, and a bit of a risk taker, you know, like I like the adrenaline, I like trying new things, and I'm not afraid to fail. So I think that's kind of what um, pushed me to do this as well. And I'm young, I don't have any responsibilities, I don't have a family, (laughs) or mortgage, or kids. And if anything happens, then I can just move back in with my parents. So I kind of have that safety net as well, um, just in case. I think it's funny hearing For me, that was one of the best parts about going on the entrepreneurial journey is that mindset change. I mean, I'm from small town America. When I first took this job, my my family thought it was a scam. I I still get questions about what I do. I think people think it's an MLM, like it's not real. But it's funny when you embrace yourself in like the community, like it took you going on that trip and meeting other entrepreneurs and listening to the podcast, like a whole world opens up of opportunity and risk. And I don't know if you feel the same, but sometimes I'll talk to people. I'm like, man, if they can grow a successful business, so can I. Because I feel like I've done so much like due diligence and read so many books. And it all comes down to like confidence. There's so many people who don't have a perfect product or perfect operating system. And they're still succeeding because they just went out and did it. And at the end of the day, I think that's what matters the most. 
Yeah, it's just like taking steps, right? And I think like some people wait too long for the perfect time or whatever. And like, I mean, I'm guilty of this. I could have launched in September and I launched in December because I was like, this needs to be different. This needs to be different. I was like playing around with the website and trying to like make everything like better, quote unquote. Um, But yeah, I just decided to go for it. And when I launched, I did not feel ready at all. I wasn't ready, but it got me to where I needed to go. And then you just like learn along the way, right? Yeah. Learning on the along the way is such a big one. I, I did a webinar on failure and I was like, when you think about starting something, you think about like the utmost worst thing that can happen to you when you fail. Like when I started the company, I was just like, okay, I'm going to be without a job. I'm going to lose all my employees. I'm going to embarrass myself, but it's not. It's like these baby steps. Like no one's ready to be a CEO when you start, but you work your way up and all these small things happen first. And I think it makes it a lot easier to conceptualize when you realize it is just baby steps along the way. You don't just end up ruining your whole life and career within 12 hours, typically. Yeah. 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 Well, well said. <laughs> yeah. So true. So knowing how much goes into a successful brand nowadays, like you can, you can go viral on TikTok and that can be the core of your success, or you can get really good at advertising or influencer marketing. Like there's so many different ways. And I feel like you can be overwhelmed with shiny object syndrome. Like I just manage Amazon ads and I still can't keep up with that portion of the business. How did you find that success early on? And how did you really focus your time across all the avenues that could be successful? Yeah, so I think like it's good to pick one or two channels and like put in all your time, effort, and energy into them rather than trying to be everywhere all at once. Like I haven't touched Twitter. Um, I haven't really touched Facebook that much just because that's not really where my customers go and hang out. Um, the two that I really focus on right now are TikTok, actually Instagram too. We've been focusing more on, but I have an employee now, so I'm not totally spreading myself then. Um, and TikTok, but they're all good for different reasons. And I think like as a startup who has limited resources, limited capital, and wants to really build a solid customer base, it all comes down to community. And I think too many businesses rely on paid ads for like Instagram and Facebook and, you know, getting new customers, getting those conversions. But I think they forget their current customers or their current followers and how to keep them and make them happy and keep them coming back. Um, And again, it just comes down to building up that relationship. So I was able to do the things that a lot of my competitors weren't comfortable doing, like sending videos to my customers, sending them handwritten notes. You know, um, I sent some of my top customers like last year Christmas cards. I think there's like little things like that that are so powerful. And it's the experience that you have to really think about and put an effort to make sure that your customers are having a good experience. Um, whether that be like the package they receive or after they follow you, for example, maybe it's, you know, having your employee or you going to their Instagram page and like liking their, a few of their photos and commenting on it, like showing that you really care and you appreciate them being there. So these are the little things that kind of built the foundation of what my company is today. And I think it's what kind of made me successful because um, word of mouth is really powerful as well. And that goes such a long way. And if they have a really great experience, not only are they going to tell someone, maybe they're going to post it on their social media. Maybe they're going to post it on TikTok and then their community will see it. And then maybe someone will go purchase from their community. So um, I think that's like one thing that I really tried to focus on. And then also um, like the vulnerability and authenticity too. Like um, you go to some Instagram or TikTok profiles and you see like the product photos it's like, here's my product or service. This is why it's great. This is like how we're different from our competitors. And that's great, but people don't want to be sold to. Like they want to feel something. So you should be putting out content that pulls some sort of emotion out of them, right? Like um, whether it's like humor or it's relatable content or it's like, you know, like it could be anything. Um, So we tied in that as well. And I showed a lot of the behind the scenes of like what it's like to build a business, like packing orders in my driver's seat. And then in my, you know, my making products like in my kitchen and then in the commercial kitchen. And I had this like little wagon that I carried all my orders around to FedEx. So like showing that part of it, like it was really cool to see that because like a lot of businesses aren't comfortable sharing the behind the scenes stuff. So I tell a lot of people like try to humanize, you know, your, your social media platform. So your fault, like your followers can like connect with you on a more deeper personable level. Cause if they, you know, they love what you're doing, they see the effort that you're putting in, it's going to make them want to support you more. That is fantastic. 
I mean, every aspect of it, I think, is like the new era of commerce. I mean, Mm -hmm. never before have we had the opportunity to connect directly with like every single customer through social and be able to do things that don't necessarily scale. And that was some feedback that we got really early on is like, don't try to systemize everything. You do have to have a little bit of that human element and your customer base in the community is so small. Like you said, all it takes is one post going viral of you doing something amazing for someone. And then before you know it, that's free 90,000 views. It's not easy. There's no perfect trick to it, but I think it is. It's being human and finding your audience like and coming from your psychology background, I'm sure helps a ton. Yeah, I think it does. I like to think it does. I don't want to think <laughs> of my education being a total waste. Um, and I'm sure my parents, my parents will be happy to hear that I'm kind of using it. But um, yeah, I think for sure, like, you know, humanizing it and just thinking of your followers as like friends, you know, and like treating them that way, too. And like the language too that you have with them, like it shouldn't be so transactional, you know? Yeah, 100%. So knowing you have the fundamentals in place, you've started to build an amazing community. I feel like a lot of your values and what you're looking for is in place. What's next? Like, What's the big exciting thing that you want to grow the company into? Yeah, it's so hard to think. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, I guess the, the, the problem that I've had is... So I'm in Canada and the Canadian market, it's great, but it's very small compared to the US. Like, or yeah, Canada's whole population can fit in California. And still, California is still bigger than Canada, which is mind blowing, right? And that's one state. So I've created this like, you know, following of people who are primarily American. And my product right now, the one that we have in Canada is frozen, and we can't really ship it to the US. So um, like this year, we're opening up the US market and hopefully like getting product out that way and just making it like a household name that is like the end goal. Um, And I just want to have lots of innovation, launch new and exciting products that are cleaner and better for you. And the three pillars of the brand is fun, functional and nostalgia. So those are kind of, you know, the the feelings and the 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 words that describe Rodo and what it is. And yeah, I guess just continue to grow the brand, the products that we have and then the team as well, because I took it from was a solopreneur for two years. And then now I have officially like three people on my team and continuing to grow, which is really awesome because if the team's growing, that means the company's growing and that's what we want. So <laughs> that's amazing. You know, I want to kind of circle back to something you said earlier that connects to that. It was you realize what you didn't want to do. And I, I feel like I went through a similar journal journey where we talked to a lot of different advisors, like private equity. We didn't know what we wanted to do or what we wanted to be. And everyone kept saying, know your number. I was like, what does that mean? They're like, know the number you want to exit for. And I was like, I don't like this piece of advice. I'm young. There's no idea what we're going to grow into. And I'm really enjoying the journey up until this point. So I can never come up with a number. Like, who knows? Once you get to 50 million or 100 million, maybe you're still going to be enjoying it. Like, I didn't like having that as like my benchmark. So what I decided is like what I didn't want. And it was a very similar experience of it's... I don't want to have a poor reputation. I don't want to grow just for the sake of growing. I want to maintain positive mental health because entrepreneurship can be exhausting. And I want to experience things and connect with people. So once I was able to come up with that list of like, Hey, here's kind of the priorities based off what I do not want. That was something that really helped me scale and figure out what what the next steps are. Because you never know. I mean, it takes one connection on LinkedIn or one person reaching out to forever change the rest of your company. And I was so overwhelmed trying to forecast like what the next 3, 5, 10 years would be. Because I'm like, that's not how my brain works. Like, There's so much more opportunity in this. Yeah, it's so true. And there's so many variables that play into it and everything can just kind of change, right? Like, I feel like I'm always updating my business plan. Like it's never, (laughs) it's never staying the same and things always like go in a different direction, good and bad, right? Um, And like, that's, that's the exact same thing that I was thinking of. Like I was really struggling like last year this time and I had an opportunity to pursue something else and get out of this. And like, I sat on it and I really thought about it. Cause you know, like not profitable, not paying myself, not living the life, you know, um, yep. everything looks a certain way, but it's actually like the opposite in most cases. Yep. Like it's really hard getting something off the ground. And, um, I think for me, like if I were to get out of this and quit quote unquote, 
Um, I think the guilt would be too much for me to handle because I know I didn't give it my all and that's something else. Like I want to make sure like I can take it as far as I can. And like you said, like still, you know, take care of my mental health, still be enjoying it. Like um, if you're doing something that you're miserable about and you're not passionate about, it's not sustainable and you're not going to be able to build it and grow it into what it could be. So um, I think just like constantly checking in with yourself and being like, Hey, I know it's hard, but like, am I actually liking what I'm doing? Or, you know, am I miserable? And then am I miserable and broke? Or am I just broken, you know, <laughs> handling it? So I think knowing those things too is super important. A hundred percent. I want to get into your operational side, but one other thing that I would add, and I'm curious to hear if it's been the same for you, entrepreneurship is lonely as shit. I mean, some people get really lucky and have, you know, like a large team getting into it and that helps a lot. But like my first few years was draining. I had everyone from like my home life questioning what I was doing, questioning why I was working so much. I got all the feedback of, you're going to regret working this much in this period of your life. You could be doing this, this, and this. And just not having people that actually understood my problems. Everyone just saw like the perception of, oh, you're getting to travel. You're getting, you get to work for your own schedule. You don't have a boss, things like that. And I was like, no, this is so lonely. Like it is a roller coaster. Like I have a little graph attached to my um, computer and it's just this because that's all entrepreneurs. There's no baseline. But helping build a community, which is why this podcast was started and why we've really built this network was so that way everyone could see like we're all in the same thing together. We're all dealing with a lot of the same issues. So being able to build that community really made my mental health like 10x better because I had the right people to talk to and to go to and realize, okay, I'm not drowning alone in an ocean. I have a few other people here too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, I think for the first year and a half, almost two years, I didn't have anyone. I had my friends. They worked for the government. They had like the nine to five. Like I couldn't go to them with, I, I'd go to them, but they'd be like, you'll figure <laughs> it out. You're great. You know, like you yes. got it. So it didn't really help me. Um, and then a lot of people couldn't really understand what I was going through and what I was doing. And I remember telling my parents what I was doing, like quit my job, went backpacking, come, I come home and then I'm Googling business workshop near me and driving to a business resource center, learning how to write a business plan for a cookie dough company. And they're like, they're boomers. So they don't even eat cookie dough. <laughs> so they're like, they're like, first off, like who's going to buy this, right? Like, you know what I mean? Um, they were like, they were supportive, but they didn't understand it. And my mom was like, you know what, like, if this is what you want to do, you know, I believe in you. I love you. And my dad was just like, I don't understand it. I don't understand it at all. Now he does now that I'm like, you know, growing and like scaling the business. And you know, there's actually like a number of revenue. Um, So now he's like, wow, it's actually you have a cookie dough business. So, (laughs) you know, things kind of flip like only when you start to grow and you get through like the really, really hard beginning where everyone's kind of like, like, what the fuck are you doing? Right. Um, But uh, I think like, podcasts have helped me so much. And like, that's why I love you that you're doing this because it's going to help so many people. And I remember just like listening to taste radio was one and they would just have founders come on that told their stories about like manufacture, like kitchen nightmares and supply chain. And like, I'd be going through the same things and I'd be listening to it. Like, yes, they understand, you know, like I can, I can relate to this. And it just like, it made me feel so like, it was so comforting, like sitting at my desk, like working and it felt like, like I knew these people. And then what I did, I started going on LinkedIn and then finding these people from these podcasts and like reaching out to them and being like, Hey, listen to your episode. You are so yes. great. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and then yeah, joining communities like later on, once I started to kind of build on social and get more involved with networking, like it tenfold, like made a huge difference. And that's where I've met some of my closest friends and we don't even live in the same country. So it's pretty cool. A hundred percent. I'm the exact same. I I went to one event that I was scared shitless to go to for being honest. Like I'm not much of an ex... I am an extrovert when needed, but I don't love throwing myself in those environments. Uh, My COO actually bought my ticket and was like, you're going to this conference. And eight months later, I'm, you know, flying to Europe for a wedding for another female founder who's now one of my best friends in this space. And seeing that established group, it's so much more than like having people that understand. It's like that mindset. It like really helps you level up when you're constantly in that more abundance mindset of people who just get it. Yeah, it's true. Um, and I think like it's the whole like you're the sum of the five people that you hang out with the yes. most, you know, yeah. that thing too. Like I've had 
you know what it's like it's bittersweet like you kind of grow and your circle kind of shifts and like you still have like your old friends and like family and stuff like there um but they're not necessarily like your inner circle and you kind of replace and fill in where you need and I think like that makes a huge difference and just having someone like you can like my one my best friend so he's just you know he's in Canada but he's like a flight away um and if I'm having a crisis I just like send him a voice note or if he's like going through something he sends me a message and we're just like there to like help each other through it because it is super isolating and lonely when you're doing it on your own and if you don't have like a lot of people to support you and I guess the one thing that I wish I did differently when I started is it would have been really cool to have a (laughs) co-founder as much as it it's like it's bittersweet like I know it can like end badly and there could be some like you usually need like a mediator or something in between because there can be some conflict but like it's also so nice to have someone who's going through the exact same things that you are and like on the ride with you and you can kind of go to each other and be like hey this sucks and they can be like yeah this sucks but this is how we're gonna solve it and Whereas if you're on your own, it's like, okay, I can go to like a few of my mentors or advisors and then I can talk to some friends, but they don't really know exactly what this feels like and like what decision they should make or I should make, right? So a hundred percent. We we got super lucky. We never planned on like scaling as a leadership team. It was more of a side hustle in the beginning because we all have the same skill set. But we recently went through a a million different personality tests, all these different things. We brought in a expert to help us just look at like our personality analysis across our leadership team. And he was like, you have the perfect combination. He was like, on accident, like you did not mean to, but you have the the visionary in the right seat and you have the integrator who's also great with teams. So like hearing that was absolutely amazing, but it is, it's such a core aspect and either way that you decide to do it, learning what your strengths are and having that self-awareness. Like Hearing you speak, you know exactly, hey, this is what I'm good at and this is what I want to scale at. And it's hard when you're in the beginning because you have to wear all the hats. Like You just figure shit out at that point. But then you kind of hit that level, which is like, what got you here won't get you there. And it's like, okay, what am I not the best at? And how do you start hiring for that? And when it happens naturally, like I'm sure it will as your team continues to grow, like you'll you'll probably find that person, you know, the COO that just fits perfectly with your weaknesses. And I think that's an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's a thing that I just, you know, wearing all the hats at the beginning is a blessing in disguise because it forces you to learn all aspects of your business. And even though you're not very good at everything, like no one is good at everything, you know, like what the job is and how long it takes to do things. And then when you're ready to like delegate that and offload that to someone else, you know exactly what they're doing and you can train them to do it. Right. And they can't really like pull the wool over your eyes and be like, yeah, this is going to take X amount of time. And you know what I mean? (laughs) Um, Whereas you're like, no, this should be like done by this time. And this is what needs to be done. So it's like a blessing in disguise for sure. And then um, like, I I know that I'm good at marketing. I'm good at building community. I suck at operations. I suck at forecasting. I suck at like, you know, numbers and stuff. So I'm like, okay, I need a bookkeeper. I need to bring on like an operations manager and like have these people like fill in the spots that I'm not good at. Because also if you spend a lot of time doing stuff that you don't enjoy and you're not good at, like it's, you're not going to be able to thrive and do the things that you are good at, right? So I think it's important to like, take your energy and efforts and dump it into like what you're really passionate about and just like blow that up and then have people support you in the weaker areas. A hundred percent. Something I love that you called out is it takes time. You know, you're not making money. Most people aren't making money immediately. And if they are, it's probably going to come to an end at some point in time. I think it's that instant gratification aspect it messes up so many entrepreneurs they like hire way too early because they want that full team from like an ego perspective or they want this and this, but you're setting the foundation. You're building the community, which doesn't scale. I mean, in the beginning, it is hard. You respond to every LinkedIn DM. You send Loom videos to every interested person and it takes up so much time. And I got so much feedback in the beginning of that journey of like, why are you wasting your time on this? Like, because I care about my reputation and the people I'm working with and the relationships. And now... Three to four years later, we're seeing all of the results from that. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's taking the time and saying, Hey, I want to build something that lasts and knowing that this is a long term bet three to five years from now. And I think that's a huge aspect, especially with e commerce. You really need to have that in place. Yeah, it's it's so true. Um, and you can like throw money at Facebook ads and Instagram ads all day <laughs> long, but like, I don't think it has the same 
impact and it's like the long term, right? Like, yep. yeah, like it might take some extra time to like message that customer or send them a video or do whatever, like go the extra mile. But then think about like how that makes them feel. And like, you know, they could be a lifelong customer and, you know, they could spend thousands and thousands of dollars with you and like want to support you and tell their friends about you. And like doing that across the board for, you know, like at the beginning, especially is so important. It goes such a long way. And even like there's companies like, I don't know if you know, Andy Frisella and First Form, um, but he has like, it's like a piece of supplements, apparels, energy drinks, food, like everything like that in like the health space. And he is the CEO basically of this billion dollar company. And he still sends like handwritten notes to people, some of the customers, first customers that have ordered from him. And like, that's their whole thing is like, they kept the small business feel with the growth of the company, which I really love. And that's like the thing that I really want to keep is try to like have that, like, you know, that, that feeling that like the company really cares and we're not too big or not just going to send you like a generic like copy paste thank you message or whatever like I want them to feel more than that and like give them the reason to like share like tell someone about how great of an experience they had so I think like companies like that I look to for inspiration at the size that they're at it's like okay they can do it they made it work at the size they're at it's totally possible you just have to like find a way to like scale it and still keep that yeah have have you read small giants by chance no I haven't is it, is so, it like, is it about this? <laughs> it's that whole topic. So they go through like all these different examples. Cliff Bar is one of them. And they talk about Cliff Bar had the opportunity. They actually were in the room, like signing their deal to be purchased by either Nestle or PNG or something like that. And the founder walked away from the deal. And he ended up having to pay out his co-founder like $100 million or something like that because he walked away from the deal and needed to buy her out because she wanted to go through the acquisition. And the whole gist of the book is talking about these large companies, these giant companies that still kept the small town feel in all these different ways. And he talks about... He uses a word and vibe is the first thing coming to mind, but it's not. And he talks about how they've maintained the culture and the vibe and the love without becoming like overly systematized and bureaucratic. And it was really, really eye opening. And it talks about saying no a lot of, hey, you're going to get, as you start growing and your authority grows, everyone's going to reach out to you for these crazy deals and all these opportunities. And you can say yes to everything, but then you're spread thin, not doing anything well, and you lose the vibe and the energy of your company. So it talks about how you can say no and like focus on all of these right areas and how you can maintain like those values that you've created and make sure that they like trickle down to every employee. And it was really eye opening because everyone, especially in the last two years, you know, highlights the big exit and the PR and, you know, you had all the aggregators come into the space and all these crazy valuations. It's so easy to get caught up in that. So they talk about like how you can define that culture in a way that allows you to be both like still grow, but maintain that vibe for lack of a better term. (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And that's like something that I'm like learning so much about is company culture, right? Like it's one thing to have you yourself when you're in the business as a solopreneur, but then you start bringing in people and not everyone is going to have the same passion as you do for what you're doing. Right. And I think like, you know, um, having that vision, like what, what, what is your purpose of your company? What's your mission? And like communicating that internally, especially as you grow, I'm sure like as you get bigger teams, like it's harder to manage that and like communicate that and keep that feel and like still do things like team building exercises and making it more than just like a big corporate, you know, like environment, which is like the thing that I fear the most. And I know like eventually, like most startups have to bring in people who, you know, have done it, have built companies and taken them from like 100 million to 500 million or whatever, like scale it. Um, Because obviously, like they have the experience, but like until you get there, like how do you still keep that? I guess that feel, right? The vibe. I'll have to check the book out. It sounds awesome. I am so excited. Like I need you to take a look at it. And then we totally need to have a follow up podcast afterwards because it was one of the most exciting books. Like every time you read a book that like is parallel to how you've thought you wanted to run the company, it's like a breath of fresh air. Like sometimes I'll read them and I'll be like, okay, this sucks. I like Intel has a really good book, but it's heavily based on like operating systems. And I was like, this sounds boring. (laughs) Like everyone recommends it, but this is not me. And Small Giants was one of those books that's like, okay, I can do both. You can grow to a certain size and still enjoy every single day of your company. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. All right. So 
put penciling that in on my calendar follow up after you get a chance to check that out. Well, I have uh, tell you a thousand different things I want to talk to you about, but I think we can save those for later. So I would love to know, you know, you've grown to over 60,000 followers on LinkedIn. You've built a community. You've learned from a ton of podcasts. How do you still stay in touch, not get overwhelmed? Like, is there any main people or podcasts or anything that you go to as like a constant source of truth that can be valuable to the audience? So, man, I mean, I guess I have like things that help me cope and like kind of bring me down. Like I do listen to podcasts. Like I really love like Ed Milet. Um, Mm -hmm. He's a really great um, leader and he's like one of the highest paid motivational speakers as well. Like he's incredible. Um, I'm in a business group called Arte Syndicate run by Ed Milet and Andy Frisella. And like the people in that community are like really awesome. And they've just been a great resource full of knowledge. Like if I have a problem or anything, or I need to talk to someone about something that's been a place. Um, I like, I guess aside from that, like I try to do like mindfulness stuff and like, I need to get back into it, but I used to journal every morning and that was so helpful for me. Um, like if I'm having a really hard day, like I'll oftentimes just like go grab my journal and like flip back to like a year ago or whatever, and just like see all the hardships and stuff that I was going through. And then it kind of puts things into perspective. It's like, okay, you know what? I thought that was so bad at the time and I got through it. We're here. We're fine. So I'll get through this too. Right. Um, so I really love doing stuff like that as well. And then just like, yeah, friends are, have been like really great. I just like have them if I need them. And then I send them a voice <laughs> note or whatever. And I used to be very afraid to like reach out because I didn't want to appear as like needy or like weak. And I thought I was a burden to people. But um, I think that is like not the way that's not the way that you should think and people want to help. And then people will be comfortable enough to come to you for help as well. If you can kind of be vulnerable and open yourself up to it. So those are all things that I've done and I do. I absolutely love that. The emotional bank account, like we don't have to talk about that too much, but that was something that I really felt as well. It's, you know, it's all an exchange of you need to feel confident enough to reach out to people because people are wanting to do the same to you and you have to be vulnerable for others to feel comfortable being vulnerable to you. And that's a whole concept that was really amazing for me to learn. Okay. I want to challenge the audience to go out and buy some bro dough because I've been really, really excited about this. Send me a screenshot. If you get some, I would love to hear feedback and share it along with the channel. We'll definitely be linking everything for this podcast, this episode. Brodo, your LinkedIn, of course. Is there anything else that you want to shout out or kind of finish with? Um... I don't know. I guess, yeah. If you go to brodo.ca, you can sign up to our waitlist and we're launching new products in the US very soon. So I don't know if most of your listeners are American or Canadian or what, but um, that'll that'll be coming soon. So, And they're really great. They taste really good. So I'm excited to get them out there. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join our podcast. We absolutely loved ha- having you and I'm sure we will stay in touch. <laughs>